Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Certified, Certiport's Educator Podcast. I'm your host, Hannah Cropo. Join us as we dive into the world of education, certification, and technology. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Certified, Certiport's Educator Podcast. We're back today with two of I have to say some of my favorite guests, I just love being able to chat with these educators, Brittany and Chad. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Glad to be here. And, you know, we were talking about this before, and I feel like Chad's going to regret ever doing anything with me ever again. But Chad is our our famous face of certified this year. So we had to bring him in, not just for the visual, but for the, the expertise as well. So we're glad to have both of you back on the podcast today. Um, Before we dive into our topic, I wanted to give you both a chance to introduce yourselves. We've had you before, but for those who haven't listened to previous episodes, um, and we'll start, Brittany, with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you teach. I am Brittany Hochstetter, and I am a communication professor at Wake Tech Community College. I've been there for quite a few years, since 2009, and been in various roles since I've been there. Um, but my favorite role is that of a teacher, an instructor. I'm taught interpersonal communication, mass communication, public speaking, soft skills in the world of, of CertiPort. And um, what else? Um, I've really enjoyed getting to know the certified community and the world of certifications. Excited to be in Orlando in June. Amazing. Thanks, Brittany. Chad, we'll come to you next. Yeah, so Chad McKenzie, um, you've probably, like Hannah said, you've seen my face. Um, hopefully you're not sick of it as much as I am. But um, yeah, I teach at Wake Tech Community College uh, with Brittany. I'm in the IT division, uh, teaching mainly like intro to computers, um, Excel, Word, that sort of thing. And I've been doing certifications now for for quite some time. Um, you Certiport, Geometric. Um, all those good things, and we'll we'll definitely share some of those tips and tricks with you all um, in Orlando. Looking forward to that. Looking forward to to meeting you all there as well. Incredible. So I have to give kind of a, a little bit of an introduction into why we're having you back on the podcast today, and you've touched on it a little bit, that both of you will be presenting at the Certified Educator Conference this year, and we're so excited to have you guys um teaching and sharing in one of our breakouts, and you've decided on the topic of internet culture and Gen Z learning, which I'm super excited to dive into a little bit today. So tell us what made you decide on sharing this topic with our community, and chat will come to you first. Yeah. Um, Hannah, I don't know if you you know this, but Brittany and I are elder millennials, and sorry if I just like... I absolutely believe that. No, I'm a millennial too. Come on. That's great. That's great. that I think that is the beginning of this process of of um we have been talking about this for for a couple of years, Brittany and I of, of the internet was turning forty years old last year, and so kind of resonates with us that we've kind of grown up with it, we've kind of seen what's happened to it, it's kind of shaped our lives um but it has also shaped the lives of gen Zers who are who were born into this and um yeah, we uh, we have done some research and looked at a, a few things and some strategies and some things that work, kind of reach this new uh, generation. And um, yeah, we're going to have some fun and uh, share share a few things with you all. And I'll, I'll let Brittany kind of share some more too. Chad and I both teach at a community college, and I know many of our listeners teach in higher ed and in K-12. And perhaps you can relate to the fact that the way that we teach now may not be the same way that we were teaching five years ago, that Gen Z is a little different than the younger millennials. And yet many of the ways that we've shaped our teaching has been around the largest generation. And the largest generation was that millennial generation. So I think part of this was, was that interest in some articles coming out talking about the internet turning 40 and and that nostalgia that we had of of being at that upper, very upper, upper part of being a millennial. Um, but it's also just practical, like having a harder time connecting to this group and realizing that they have a little different focus and they're a little different in their makeup. 
and how do we relate to them in a way that is successful? How do we connect to this group a little differently? So that was just something that we wanted to explore. And so I want to dive a little bit deeper. We obviously don't want to give too much away of what you're going to be sharing at the conference this year, but we'll start with just that difference between the learning styles of generations. So how, Brittany, do you think millennial learning is different than Gen Z learning? I think one thing that I have noticed in the past five years, and you see this kind of in headlines, there's been a lot of headlines lately about how Gen Z is struggling to connect at work and higher ed is struggling to connect with Gen Z. And I think part of that is that 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 difference we see between the millennials and Gen Z is driven by how they grew up. This is the most, this is the generation and some researchers call them the digital first generation. They likely had an iPad in their hands before they went to kindergarten. And uh, one researcher said that they um, reported that they get anxious if they're away from the internet for hours or more. They expect the internet to just drive their daily interactions. And that has to shape you, right? It's different than being um, Gen X or even an older millennial where you felt like the internet was something that you went to for convenience or you went to for entertainment versus something that you rely upon um, all the time and you expect to be there like turning on the tap water. Um, So Gen Z is a little different. They're much more gamified. They're much more um, interested in these little um, subcultures and, and niche interests because the internet afforded them so much more access to all of that. Um, so we we found that they are more interested in authentic interactions. Maybe you see this in kids that you have um, or students that you have, even nephews or nieces. Like I see this in my in my kids. They'll turn on a YouTube um, video and they'll watch it and they'll have a great time watching this video that is a shaky camera and not edited well and kind of gritty in its production value versus watching. Um, something made in Hollywood, because to them it feels real, it feels authentic, um, and I think that that interest in authenticism, um, authenticity, and um, and connecting with with somebody is is a unique feature of Gen Z. I really like that, and I think that that plays into how they approach learning in the classroom. Right, it has to be that more authentic experience and more connected to the content. And I know the other part of what you guys are planning to present is about internet culture, which I think we've touched on a little bit. But for those who aren't familiar with that term, tell us a little bit about internet culture. What does that mean? Well, we won't give everything away, but I mean, internet culture, like what does that mean? Um, I don't know that, that I can define it. It doesn't really have one singular definition. Um, we came across a really, a really interesting writer, um, Nathan Al- Albach, and he wrote, and something we'll share in our session, he wrote a great piece talking about internet culture, talking about where what is internet culture? Can you define internet culture? And he talks about what's the point of of even trying to define internet culture because it's not singular. But if we don't have some way of wrapping our mind around inter- the internet, then then how can we start to understand this thing that shaped us, right? This thing has shaped us for 40 years in ways we're still trying to understand. Um, and if we don't, we don't try to dig into what its culture is, um, then we're really missing something. And one way that he tries to define its culture is by saying it was really born of like um, rebellion. He said rebellion, cyberpunks, nerds, the disenfranchised, the avant-garde movement, um, cyberpunks, like a lot of nerds um, and little niche subcultures really birthed the internet. And what's interesting about that is you see that parallel in Gen Z. 
that they also are interested in fandom and um, really little little pockets of of subculture too. And so that's that's where this this presentation got interesting for us was seeing those parallels that Gen Z was shaped by the internet, but it also took this heavy hand in shaping the internet. And so the deeper we can understand what is internet culture and what are those broad ways we can understand the culture of the internet, that can give us these little handles for understanding Gen Z itself. Um, one way that that we have pushed in and trying to understand it is if you go to visit another country, you would say that country has kind of a culture or the area has a culture. Well, you would try to figure out how they communicate, like what dialects do they speak? Um, and even if you're not fluent in that language or that dialect, even if you can get a little bit of it, right, it gives you confidence in, in communicating with them. So in our presentation, we kind of boil that down into three dialects of internet culture. And if we're able to understand that and then transfer that to the way that we communicate with, with Gen Z, um, it's, it's a really fascinating way to look at the way you teach. And can impact the approach that you take, right, in the classroom. And I yeah. think that, that that ultimately is what a lot of teachers are looking for. I know I've talked to other educators who are in similar situations, especially post-pandemic, that students are coming to the classroom with a very different mindset than I think they've had before. And so how we teach impacts how they learn, right, because of this culture and the, the experiences that these students have had. So, Chad, I wanted to come to you and talk about, I mean, we don't need to get into everything that we're going to be sharing at the conference, but what are some of these classroom strategies that educators can use to teach Gen Z and this new generation of students? Yeah, I mean, I think as Brittany mentioned, um, you know, we need these dialects to understand and communicate better. And so we'll, we'll definitely share more of those, those, those things there. But one, one particular dialect is humor. Um, and we have we've done some research on that and and we we've, we've come across some good quotes like if they're learning they're laughing um or if they're laughing they're learning and that humor boosts cognitive function and it connects and so we kind of took and took that particular dialect and roll with it and you know we think about some strategies that we could use with humor um and hannah you know uh I teach excel in computers and often that's not often thought of as being fun and 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 humorous, um, but you know, and I, and I grew up in, a, in the business in the business world and and business school where where suit and tie and professionalism was the, was the main thing. Um, but I do think that there's room and there's space um, to include humor. Um, obviously, your whole class can't be jokes and memes, but I think there is a time and a place for it, and I think it does resonate with with Gen Zers. Um, I use a lot of a lot of memes in my Excel class, and um, I was just telling Brittany yesterday. I got some feedback from from my class this semester where um, I had a had a student say, "I love the memes. Keep adding them; it makes my day. It brings some cheer to my schoolwork." I hadn't heard anything all semester about it until I, until this final evaluation. So I I can see where where it works. It's that a little bit of humor I can bring to, to an Excel course, um, and so. In our presentation, we're gonna we're gonna show you some of those things. Uh, we're actually gonna try some out. Um, let you let you build a few things. Um, I can't give it all away right now, but you, we'll get some hands on on training with that. Um, things you can actually practically use and put in your class. Um, but yeah, we, we think humor we think humor is good, and and Brittany will will attest to this. She she's the humor queen with all of her jokes and and um, dad jokes, and I think. Um, I think we can be humorous in our in our own authentic way, and I think the students appreciate that. Agreed, agreed. Brittany, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that as well? Yeah, I think I think it's really important to reach this generation that we are open and try to share our authentic selves. And when you are being yourself around your friends and your family. The humor comes naturally, but when you get in front of a classroom, sometimes you you feel like what Chad said with like the suit and tie and and the you know like sit up a little straighter. 
you don't always feel comfortable to be funny or to be vulnerable in that way. Um, but that connects really well with, with these students when you can tell a funny story or use self-deprecating humor or send um, a funny announcement, even just including emojis in, in something that you send, an email that you write. Um, those are very relatable to the students and they give them a chance to, to take a deep breath. Um, anxiety is something that Gen Z struggles with a lot. And so anything that we can do to kind of set them at ease and make them feel more comfortable helps them to build that bridge between us and them. And humor is just really one of the best ways that we can do that. I certainly use humor more now than I did even five years ago. Um, I think I used it more organically five years ago, but now I'm much more intentional about it that even in informal stiff ways, I, I will say, okay, if I'm just reminding them about a test or a quiz coming up, I will still try to find a way to send something funny or lighthearted along with that reminder. Um, whereas before I, I wouldn't have thought to do that because I would have thought, well, this is just, I'm just, this is just doing business. Um, so I think that I've had more success reaching this generation by using some of these strategies and some of them are not hard. Um, but there are some fantastic tools out there that make doing this easier for instructors. And we want a chance to show you those tools and provide some resources that can make it um, more efficient. I'm really excited to be able to dive into some of those because I think a lot of educators are excited about the prospect of of modifying their teaching style to be able to connect with these students, but don't always know how. And so I think being able to dive into some of those tools will be incredibly helpful. But as we close out today, to to your point, we don't want to give everything away from the conference. Let's just do a a little piece. Um, What advice would you share with our listeners about adapting their teaching style to this new generation, to this different uh, group of students? And Brittany, we'll come to you first. Hmm. Well, we we have a whole one pager that we that we share of advice, um, but but one thing that that Chad and I have talked about even just in the last month, um, maybe you've seen or you've been a part of this this new thing about um, the New York Times game connections. Have you mm-hmm. heard of that, Hannah? Mm-hmm. Um, so we found this website that helps teachers build their own connections game. Um, And that's something simple, but Gen Z is really into games and even crosswords. And I read an article talking about how they didn't expect this generation to be interested in some of what they would refer to as like more old fashioned games, like crosswords. Um, But Gen Z grew up gaming. They grew up with games. And um, I think the more we can incorporate games into our classroom, even just taking a quick moment, taking a 30 second game break um, and trying to stay up with not just any game, but what is the game that they're playing? Like, what is what is the trend they're up to right now? Um, I think that is that speaks their language. Oh, this teacher's trying to do and cares about what I care about. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I think that's something that just we talked about in the, in the past month. I'm excited to learn more about that. I think those tools are, are wonderful opportunities, right, to plug into some of the trends of the moment. So I think that's great. Chad, did you have anything you wanted to add to that as well? Yeah, I'll, I'll piggyback off on, on, on what Bernie said. But, you know, do do the research, you know, see, what, um, see what's happening. Uh, talk to your students. Get, get, their, get their feedback. Um, they'll they'll tell you what is working and what's not and so um you know you can figure out what excites them about um about life in general and what you can actually bring into the classroom you know i think students these days have more opportunities they have more options for learning than ever before than than even i ever had and so what is it about my class or this program or um, my teaching that is going to make a difference in their life. Um, 
And I think that we, each, each of us as teachers, we have our own authentic experiences that we can bring to the classroom that they can't get anywhere else. Um, you know, in the advent of AI, they, they can get a lot of answers out there really quickly. So what is it that we can bring and, and humanize um, even online learning and, and even the classroom? What can we bring um, as, as teachers? And, and uh, just, just take some time to, take time to think about that. Um, and I would just say simply, you know, try, try one new thing, see what happens. And then if it doesn't work, try something else. It, and it, it, it'll be all right. So, Going back to that vulnerability, right, of being willing to break down the barriers, try something new, because I think that students need to see that authenticity. I think that it's all coming back to that. They're looking for a chance to connect with the content, but also with with you as the educator. So I love, I love that plug. I think that's a great final note to end on. Well, I'll just give my plug for our certified educator conference. We're coming up and it's, it's crazy to think we're just about six weeks away now, which is so exciting. Um, but if you have questions about the conference or are interested in more about what we're going to be sharing there, I would encourage you to visit our website. We'll drop the link to that in the show notes, but we're really looking forward to seeing Brittany and Chad, our other presenters there and, and learning from their expertise. So thank you for giving us a little behind the scenes preview. We're excited to see you guys in Orlando in just a few weeks. So thank you for being here with us. We appreciate you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to another episode of our podcast. We're so happy to have you as part of our certified community. Make sure to follow and rate our podcast so that we can bring more educators into our wonderful and supportive group. We're also here to connect, so feel free to join us by visiting www.certified.certiport.com. 